Good evening. So um, I was asked a really fascinating question, a question that captured my imagination. And when that happens, so you uh, want to share it. And so the question that I received was, when Mashiach comes, will we wear clothing? In, in the Messianic era, when Mashiach, the long-awaited Messiah, arrives, will we wear clothing or will we revert to the original state of the human being, which was to be naked, like Adam and Eve? Which, uh, it's a fascinating question because there is an idea that Adam and Eve were the pinnacle the highest level of creation created by God himself and by when Mashiach comes we are going to go back to that state of perfection of purity and so clothing was only worn as a result of sin after the sin is corrected and we go back to the original state what do we need clothing for will we go back to being naked. <laughs> it's, it's a fascinating question that um, I can't say I haven't thought of it. I ha I've, I've also pondered it, but never looked into it properly. But because I was asked, and usually I don't do requests unless I'm asked, and so I, I, I wanted to look into this and find out what, what do our great sages say about this topic. It's important to know, I guess, you know, the wardrobes that we are investing in now, are they just temporary? And when Mashiach comes, we won't need them anymore? Is clothing going to be a thing of the past? All those who are in the world of fashion, will they have to find some other means to keep themselves busy? Like, will that be it? Will we not need clothing anymore? So, I'll have to be honest, I did not find any exact sources that directly answer the question. I didn't find anywhere where it was written an answer, will we wear clothing when Mashiach comes? But I found enough that uh, indicate an answer or direct towards an answer that I, I believe we can answer the question. And now it's not surprising that I didn't find a source that directly addresses it, because generally speaking, what will happen in the times of Mashiach, in the futuristic times, we know very little. And the great Rambam, Maimonides, says that uh, it's not even worth guessing about these things, because when it happens, we'll, we'll know what happens. We should anticipate and wait and look forward to Mashiach. That should be something that is urgent and on our mind. But to explore what exactly is going to happen, that we'll find out when it happens. At the same time, when you do learn what we can glean, whatever information we can grab about what will happen in the futuristic times, it makes it a bit more real and more exciting. To fulfill the command that Maimonides himself says it's one of the 13 attributes of faith, the basic, most fundamental attributes of, of Jewish faith are to believe and to yearn for, be excited for, anticipate the coming of Mashiach. You can only do that if you have an, a, a bit of an inkling of what you're looking forward to. And so, therefore, it is important to study into it as much as we can. Even though we may not be able to come to conclusive ideas of exactly what's going to happen when Mashiach comes, but we can explore what our sages have told us, what they have revealed, and that will make it all something more real rather than a fairy tale. You know, sometimes this Mashiach idea is like this, you know, the end of times, as if it's imaginary. But it needs to be spoken about like it's real because it is, and we hope it will come very soon. And particularly now, this time of year is an appropriate time to be discussing this. But during, during the three weeks of mourning for the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, it was during this time of year that both temples were destroyed in Jerusalem. And it's during this time of year that we anticipate the rebuilding of the temple when Mashiach comes. And so having a discussion like this is quite appropriate for this time. So the question is, will we wear clothing when Mashiach comes? Now, before we attempt to answer it, I want to give color and clarity to the question itself. 
the, the basis of this question is that clothing is not the natural state of the human being. That we did not start off wearing clothing, just like a baby is born without clothing. The first human beings, Adam and Eve, were created without clothing. They weren't babies. They were created, our sages say, uh, as fully developed 20-year-olds, Adam and Eve. On the day they were created, they were 20-year-olds in their maturity. But they were naked. They, they did not have clothing. The Torah in the book of Genesis, Bereshus, chapter 2, says that Adam and Eve were naked and they were not embarrassed. It was not an issue for them that they were naked. It, it was not a, an issue of self-consciousness or embarrassment. They were quite comfortable in their nakedness. That's how they were created. Something changed. And that was that they sinned. When they ate from the forbidden fruit, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that God had told them, you can eat any other fruit, but not that fruit. And they were enticed by the snake to eat that fruit. Once they did that, it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It, it meant... Eating this fruit meant in imbibing, ingesting the awareness of good and evil, which also meant ingesting a certain amount of self-awareness, self-consciousness. They were immediately aware of their nakedness and ashamed of it after eating from the fruit. So while before the fruit, as man and woman were created by God, they were not ashamed of their nakedness. Only immediately after they became embarrassed, ashamed of their nakedness after sinning by eating the forbidden fruit. So the Torah says, what did they do in their shame? They took fig leaves and covered their nakedness with fig leaves. Which uh, the sages say this could indicate that the tree, the forbidden tree itself, was a fig. Our sages, the Jewish sages, do not believe that it was an apple. Uh, it could have been a fig, others say it was a grape, possibly an etrog, uh, citron, or even wheat, possibly, but not, not an apple. One indication that it could be a fig is that they took fig leaves, Adam and Eve, to cover themselves after doing the sin because they were embarrassed of themselves. So, from this tale, from this story, we hear that the natural state of the human being is to be naked and quite comfortable with that. The embarrassment we have of being naked, the fact we're not comfortable with, with being naked, that came about as a result of sin, self-consciousness, and the, the taste of evil. And after that, we're embarrassed. And that's why one of our most terrifying dreams that many people have is where you go out and you just, you just forgot to get dressed. And you're completely naked walking down the street or going to work or school or wherever you go. And you're completely naked and in your dream you realize it and you can't believe that you did this and you're very very embarrassed that that very common dream is a res as a result of the innate shame we have of our nakedness and that came about as a result of the sin of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that being the case it would seem that nakedness and and its shame is not the way we're supposed to be that's our fallen state that's that's our state post sin and therefore when we correct that sin when we turn it around and elevate ourselves to a higher place so then we won't be embarrassed anymore we won't be ashamed and therefore we won't need clothing the need for clothing is only because of the fall but once you've healed that fall and fixed it, done chuva, repented, then the need for clothing will have become obsolete. And we can go back to our natural state, quite literally, au natural, naked, without any anything covering over us. That that would seem to be the the idea behind the question. And um and so therefore, because our belief is that the coming of Mashiach is introducing a time of correcting the sin of Adam and Eve, of going back to the Eden state, the, the highest state, the highest and most pure state that we were pre-sin, that the human being is going to go back to that state. So it would seem that 
that should include nakedness, going back to nakedness. Now, to be a little bit picky, but, but specific, that state of going back to higher than, than the sin, going back to the, the pre-sin state of Eden, that is something that's not necessarily going to happen immediately upon the coming of Mashiach. But that's something that our sages teach will come when we have what's called Tchir Samesim, the revival of the dead. That when Mashiach comes, the world remains as it is, just a new teacher comes, a new leader comes to teach us a better way of living. But not necessarily do any miracles happen for that, for that to occur. Mashiach can be a, a, an event that happens in the news and we realize that somebody's arrived to teach us a better way of living and everyone starts listening. It doesn't have to be miraculous. The miraculous times come later when the dead come back to life. That's the biggest miracle that we can imagine. And all, the, all those who lived in previous generations who contributed to making the world ready for Mashiach deserve to be a part of it. And therefore they come back after the coming of Mashiach at some stage. That's when we live a supernatural life. So it's then that we reach the level of Adam and Eve before they sinned. That's when we, we become renewed. Um, the, the previous Rebbe of Chabad says in, in one of his discourses that, and he bases this on the teachings of his own father, the Rebbe Rashab, that just like Adam and Eve were created by the hand of God, unlike the rest of human beings who were born from a human being, Adam and Eve were created directly by Hashem, by, 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 by the divine hand. So therefore their bodies were extremely pure and holy. However, they sinned and we are born after that sin. And so therefore our bodies don't have that equal level of holiness. However, at the revival of the dead, the resurrection that will, will happen after Mashiach's arrival, all those who passed away will come back to life. But who resurrects them? Hashem. Hashem resurrects them. And therefore their bodies are remade, reconstructed by the hand of Hashem, just like Adam and Eve were at the beginning of time. And so therefore the level of holiness will be equal to Adam and Eve before they sinned. P the pure creation of Hashem himself. That's how, how all those who, who merit the resurrection will be. That's the level we'll be on. And not only that, but we'll actually be higher than Adam and Eve. Because Adam and Eve, as pure as they were, they still could sin. The proof of that is they did. They did sin. So as holy as they were, they had the possibility of sinning. And that's because evil existed, not in them, but outside of them. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were pure, but there was a snake. There was a tree of knowledge, a forbidden tree. There was the existence of evil in the Garden of Eden, and therefore the possibility of doing sin. Whereas when the dead are revived in the future messianic era, so the possibility of evil will be vanquished because evil will be vanquished. There will be no evil in the world. That is a part of the, of the futuristic promise that negativity, evil will be vanquished from the world. There'll be no, no, no death. And therefore our bodies will be completely pure and holy will be, will live forever. We will have eternal life as Adam and Eve would have had, had they not sinned. And not only that, we're even higher than Adam and Eve because we cannot sin. Not only internally, there's no evil. Externally, there's no evil. There's no opportunity to do evil. That's how holy the body will be in the future. So we will regain that state, the state of the, of the pre-sin and even go higher than that. Not when Mashiach comes, but when the revival of the dead happens. That's when we'll go to, the, to, to this level. And so, therefore, the question really should be edited. Will we wear clothing when the dead are resurrected? Because when the sheikh comes, nothing necessarily changes. Life goes on as normal. In fact, a, a, a proof that we will definitely wear clothing when the sheikh comes is the famous uh, sta statement of the Talmud that's very often quoted that says that when the sheikh comes, the food will grow on the trees. And even um, clothes will grow, on, will grow on trees. Now, this contradicts what I said earlier, that no miracles will happen when Mashiach comes. But it's been explained that yet yeah, when the first 
period of Mashiach's arrival, no, no miracles will happen. But then, as time goes on, miracles will start to happen, such as food growing ready to eat on trees and clothing sprouting from trees ready to wear. So we will get into a, a miraculous time and clothing is included there. If, if we don't need clothing, what do we need it growing on the trees? It seems that when Mashiach comes, we will certainly wear clothing. The question is, when the resurrection of the dead happens, will we wear clothing then? And here as well, we do have certain indications that the answer is yes. There are certain set statements of our sages that seem to indicate that we will wear clothing at the resurrection of the dead, when, when the dead, dead are brought back. There's one, one source is the Midrash. The Midrash is the rabbinical tradition of teachings uh, that are from the same time as, as the Talmud. And in the Midrash, it says a statement about the revival of the dead, specifically talking about the revival of the dead. And it says that just as a person goes, so will he return. Meaning, the way you leave the world is the way you come back into the world. Many people ask the question, the resurrection of the dead, how will it work? Are you going to be re resurrected as a young person? Are you going to be resurrected the same age that you died? So this seems to answer it. The Medrash says that just as you left the world, that's how you're going to come back. When you're, res when you're resurrected, you're going to come back the way you left off. Continues the Midrash. If the person died blind or deaf or mute, they will return blind, deaf or mute. So the, the same blemishes, the same uh, lack that your body had, inabilities, will still be there. Continues the Midrash. As he goes clothed, he will return clothed. What you're wearing when you left the world is what you'll be wearing when you come back into the world. So when you're resurrected, you'll be wearing the same clothes as you died in. And then, continues the Midrash, God said, let them rise as they went, and afterwards I will heal them. Meaning, yes, if you died blind, you'll come back blind. But then God will heal you, and he will heal that blindness. If, if you were deaf, you'll come back deaf, and God will heal the deafness. And whatever other uh, ailments your body had, or inabilities, or, or lacks, or injuries, or whatever, God will fix them all after you've come back. So you come back the way you left, and then God brings healing. And included in that is that as you went clothed, you'll come back clothed. Which is a clear indication that we will wear clothes when we are resurrected. I mean, the Medrash says it, that you're going to wear the clothes that you left this world in. There's a discussion. Does that mean you're going to wear the clothes that you died in? Or does that mean you're going to wear the clothes that you were buried in? Uh, one opinion is that the, the clothes you died in, you should, you, you, should, you should dress for the future because you're going to wear these clothes when you come back. Another opinion is that, no, it's talking about the clothes that you were buried in, the shrouds. As is Jewish tradition, we're buried in very simple shrouds. Those shrouds are a preparation for the resurrection. You're going to come back in those clothes. Of course, those clothes have certainly decomposed. Okay, just like the body is brought, brought back, the clothes are brought back, and you're brought back in your clothes. But what's clear from this source is that we will wear clothes at the resurrection. There's another fascinating discussion, this is in the, in the Talmud, where it even goes into a legalistic discussion about the clothes we will wear when we're resurrected. Uh, the discussion is, it's in the Talmud tractate Nida, 61b, for those who want to look up the, the source in the Talmud, Samach um, Aleph Amad Beis, in tractate Nida, and it says there, there's a discussion there about the laws of Shatnez. Shatnez is the law that the Torah says that, are, that we are not allowed to wear clothing that are mixed wool with linen. That, that a, a shirt, a jumper, a pair of pants, a dress, anything that's made of wool and linen together 
woven together, that is forbidden. You know, we're not allowed to wear such clothing. Why? We don't know. There's no rationale given for this law in the Torah. There are explanations given by, by the sages, but it's not for now. It is a prohibition, uh, a Torah prohibition, one that, that is maybe lesser known, but it is a, is, is a prohibition. The majority of clothes today do not have that mixture. However, it is possible, and cer certain suits and uh, certain garments do have these mixtures. You need to get them checked. There are tailors around the world who are trained in this, people who can check for shutners, can check a, gar a garment, and make sure there is no sharpness. It once happened to me. I did. I do. I haven't had suits checked, uh, and never, never have I found sharpness except for once. Once I had a jacket that was given to me by my grandparents, who received it from a friend. So this was a, one of my grandparents' friends gave them a jacket that maybe I would like. Uh, it was a nice blue suit jacket. And um, a hand-me-down from my grandparents' friends, and I had it checked for sharpness to just just make sure it was an old European jacket, as my grandparents and their friends were too, and it ended up that underneath the collar there was a lining of flax, which is linen, um, and it was a woolen suit. So he had a woolen suit with with linen sewed into it. It was sharpness. And to fix it would have cost more than buying a new suit. And so I couldn't wear it. That was it. Couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't wear it anymore. It, it, it was, it was, it was not, not a kosher suit. That's the only time I've ever actually found shutners. But apparently there are suits out there and you've got to be careful. It's not always enough to read the ingredients of the suit. It needs to be checked. So the Talmud, in discussing the laws of shutners, says what happens if you have let's say a garment that if it's a woolen garment and a thread of linen was thread into the garment let's say by accident you didn't realize you you, you didn't realize what you're doing so i mean the solution is very simple to remove that thread of linen once once you've removed the thread of linen it's just wool it's all, it's all fine but what happens if you lost the thread of linen in a garment you don't know exactly where it is in the garment so now you've got a garment that has somewhere in it a mixture of linen into wool, but you don't know where it is. What can you do with this garment? So the Talmud suggests a few possibilities. One possibility is why not sell it to a non-Jew? Because non-Jews don't have this commandment. It's a, it's a part of the Torah that is commanded to Jewish people. This is not a commandment that applies to the entire world. A non-Jew is completely allowed to wear shatnas, to wear a, a wool and linen garment. So why not sell this garment to a non-Jew? So the Talmud says you can't do that. You can't do it. Because as long as that garment is still in existence, you might come to take a bit of it, or take a bit of it back, buy it back, and you don't know where the shutness is. And so therefore, selling it to a non-Jew is, is not allowed. Even using it for the saddle of your, of your donkey is not allowed. Because, again, you might come to, to use it. You might, you might come to, to remove a piece of it, and that, and that may be the shutness. So we can't leave this garment in existence, because if it's in existence, it could come back to Jewish use, and that is forbidden. So the Talmud says what you can do with this shatnas garment where you don't know where the shatnas is, so you can't remove the shatnas. What you can do is you can use it for the shroud of a dead person. It can be used as, as shrouds because there's no concern that you're going to take it back. Once it's buried with somebody, it's not coming back for use. And so therefore, we're not, we're not concerned that a Jew is going to end up utilizing this forbidden garment. So, hmm, the Talmud says, well, if that's the case, if you're allowed to use this shutness, this forbidden garment to bury somebody as a shroud, and we're not concerned that it's going to be used again, that must mean that in the future, mitzvahs won't apply. 
that when the person is revived, is resurrected, they will not be obligated in the mitzvahs anymore. Because if this were not the case, if mitzvahs would apply when the resurrection happens, so then this person is going to be resurrected wearing forbidden clothing. And you can't have benefit from such clothing when the person's not alive, when they're, when they're dead. So then we understand why they're allowed to be wrapped in forbidden clothing because a dead person does not have the obligation of mitzvahs. Mitzvahs only apply to when you're alive. But what about when you're alive again? What about at the resurrection? How, how can we bury somebody in forbidden clothing when they'll be revived? They're going to be wearing forbidden clothing. It must be that the mitzvahs don't apply in the, in the, in the future. So, the Talmud then discusses and says, yeah, the, you're, you're, it's actually true. And so, it adjusted the law and said, you can only wrap a dead body in this forbidden garment during the funeral. But you can't bury them in it. You, 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 can't, you can't bury them in the shroud because they're going to be resurrected in that forbidden shroud. And so you'd have to use some other shrouds to actually bury the person. Whatever the, the conclusion of that discussion is, we do see a, an assumption there, and that is you'll be resurrected with clothing. That the clothing that you die with, you're going to come back with. In this case, it's the clothing, clothing that you're buried with you're going to come back with. But certainly the assumption is we're going to wear clothing at the resurrection. So it seems, again, pretty clear that we will be wearing clothing even when the resurrection occurs. The question then is, why? What do we need this clothing for? Why, when we reach that level of holiness, where our body is recreated by the, the hand of God himself, when we've gone to the, the level as high as Adam and Eve before they sinned and even higher, so if they were naked and not embarrassed, why are we going to be embarrassed why we're we going to need clothing when we're resurrected. So, to understand this, we need to analyze a bit deeper what the nature of clothing is. Because we find something fascinating with Adam and Eve. That Adam and Eve, when they realized they were naked, they covered themselves with fig leaves. That's in chapter 2 of Bereshus of Genesis. In chapter 3, it says that God made clothing for Adam and Eve, which were called kosnois ur, garments of leather. That God made leather clothing for Adam and Eve. Now, they'd already had the fig leaves to cover themselves, so what was the idea of the, the leather clothing to go on top of that? And why did God himself have to make such clothing? So, it seems that there are actually two reasons to wear clothes. Clothing ha have, have two levels to it. There's one basic level of clothing, the fig leaf clothing, and then there's a level of clothing called the garments of skin, of leather, that God made. The basic reason of, of wearing clothing is because, like it says in the Torah, God, God, the Adam and Eve were embarrassed. They saw their nakedness, they were embarrassed, so they covered their nakedness. That clothing is a badge of shame, uh, a covering over of shame, of embarrassment. And that is the primary or the first reason why they got dressed the first time. That what, what, is, what is the nature of embarrassment? What does it mean to be embarrassed, to be shamed? When are we ashamed? We are ashamed when we're exposed, when people are seeing us in a light that paints us in a way that we don't want to be, or it's not true to who we are. If you think of an embarrassing moment or a shameful moment, what, what, is, what is an embarrassing moment? We've all had them. And what's the nature of embarrassment? Why are we embarrassed? It's that our persona is being presented to others in a way that we wouldn't want it to be. That it could be a false image has been given across. People are seeing us in a light that is not true, not really who we are, and so we're embarrassed of that. Or it could be that people are seeing us in a way that we are, but we're ashamed of that. We're not happy with what we are. 
with the way we are, so we are embarrassed, we feel shame. Going back to Adam and Eve, that Adam and Eve were created by God, they were given one commandment to not eat from the fruit, and they ate from the fruit. So they became ashamed of who they were. Before they ate from the fruit, they were so pure that their nakedness was not a source of embarrassment. Their body was not lowly, was, was, not, was not physical. It was an expression of their soul and not, nothing more. It was a vehicle for their soul and nothing more. There was nothing to be embarrassed about in their body. Only after they sinned and they became degraded, they became aware of good and evil. That's when the body became a lowly cover of the soul that was contrary to the soul, that was, that was not their real self. And so they were embarrassed. They were embarrassed of their bodily, physical self. After indulging in the fruit, the forbidden fruit, they became aware of their physical self and embarrassed of it. Because it's not an expression of who they really are or who they really should be. And so the way they looked, they looked like naked animals. They, they, and that was, that was shameful for them. So to any time we're embarrassed, any embarrassing moment, it's where something is being exposed that is not really who we are or it's not who, really who we want to be. Um, an example would be an embarrassing moment is, you know, like those, those hot mic moments where we don't realize that we're on camera. That, that you know, you're, you didn't realize that your camera was on or your microphone was on and people see or hear you doing things that you thought no one was watching. You thought you're having a private conversation with somebody, but meanwhile, there are people who are hearing it as being broadcast. It's, 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 it's out there. That's embarrassing. Why is it embarrassing? Because I was saying things that were perhaps appropriate for a private setting, but not to be shared publicly. And so I'm, I'm presenting some of myself in a way that I wouldn't want to present. I wouldn't want you to hear th th me saying this. Either because what I'm saying is compromising, I, I might be talking about you and I didn't want you to hear about it. So I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing and I don't want you to know I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm speaking behind your back and I don't want you to know you, that I'm doing that. So that's the embarrassing part. Or it could be that no, I, it's not that I wasn't, I was doing something wrong, but I was, I was not presenting the way I would want to be presented. I was talking about something that was not for public ear. It was for, for the private and it, it went to the wrong place at the wrong time. So that's the, that, that could be the embarrassment. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not living up to who I want to be at that moment. And so I'm embarrassed because you're hearing things that you weren't supposed to hear. That is the, the source of shame and embarrassment. And so Adam and Eve experienced this, They've, they'd fallen. They were not the divine messengers that they were supposed to be, doing what, what God wanted, making a, a world of goodness. They'd gone to, into the world of evil by eating from the fruit. And so they were embarrassed. And they covered themselves. Because what we do when we're embarrassed is we want to hide, we want to disappear. We, 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 we don't want that, that exposure so we, so we hide ourselves, we hide our source of embarrassment. That was the fig leaf, and that was what Adam and Eve immediately did in, in response to their fall, to, to their shame and their embarrassment. But then there's a, another second level of garment, of clothing, and that was God's garments that he made for them, garments of skin, of leather that, that he made for them. And it seems that this is presenting a second distinct reason for wearing clothes. When Adam and Eve sinned and therefore became more physical beings, it meant that when you looked at them, you didn't see their truth. You didn't see their soul. Before they sinned, you looked at Adam and Eve, you just saw soul. You saw a neshama. The body was translucent, was a, a presentation, a projection of the soul. That was before they sinned. After they sinned, the body-soul dichotomy began. The physical self became an enemy, a blockage, a contradiction to the soulful self. The way you and I know ourselves 
that we're a body and a soul. A soul that is pure, holy, beautiful and good. And a body that is physical, selfish and sometimes quite vulgar and gross. Two dichotomous parts of ourself. That reality began after the sin, after eating from the tree. And so when you looked at Adam and Eve post sin, you didn't see who they really were. You saw an external shell, a facade, not not a true self. And so the clothing that God made for them served as a cover for the external facade in order to allow the internal self to be expressed more. The idea of clothing from the divine perspective was that because you have this dichotomy of body and soul, so we need to cover your body so it shouldn't be a distraction and therefore you should allow your soul to shine through. As long as the body is exposed and we are physical beings, that physicality will be what our eye is attracted to and what we're what we're distracted by. If we cover that up, the covering allows an inner, deeper self to be expressed, a truer self to be expressed. And so the idea of the clothing was not just to cover up a nakedness, a shame, an embarrassment, but it was to allow a deeper light to shine a deeper self to shine. It's interesting that in in Jewish tradition, clothing is is spoken about a lot. And there are are many references to clothing in in Jewish tradition. Very often, clothing is connected with the sense of modesty, what's called sniut in Hebrew. And here again, it's sometimes misunderstood. There's a, a, a misconception that the Jewish view is that the body is ugly, is depraved, and therefore needs to be wrapped up and, and, and kept under wraps because of its uh, spiritual degradation. That's not true. The body has potential of great holiness, but when the body is uh, in isolation, when the body is seen as separate from the soul, so then the body is a distraction from the soul. When the body is covered, when that distraction is taken away, so then the soul can shine through the body. That the body can be an expression of the soul as opposed to a distraction from the soul. And so the, the laws of covering up the body, of dressing modestly, are to encourage the soul to shine through, the deeper self to shine through. And this was expressed through the, the clothing that God created, the the garments of leather. Now, interestingly, the Torah describes those garments, kot not or in Hebrew, garments of leather. There's a, a, there's a Midrash, a Talmudic tradition that says that the great rabbi of the Talmud, Rabbi Meir, in his Torah scroll, the verse that said that God made kot not or garments of leather for Adam and Eve to cover themselves with, in Rabbi Meir's Torah, it was written kot not or with an aleph. The word or means skin or leather. It's spelled ayin vavresh in Hebrew. In Rabbi Meir's Torah, it said kot not or sounds the same, but the spelling is aleph vavresh. Ayin vavresh means skin or leather. Aleph vavresh means light. And Rabbi Meir whose name Meir means to illuminate, in his Torah, it was written, kot not or with an aleph, garments of light. Now, it's debated, does that mean that Rabbi Meir had a different Torah to other people? Some say, no, no, no. he had the Torah, same Torah as everyone else, but on the side, it was written as a note, as a commentary, that kot not or, garments of leather, also serve as kot not or, garments of light. Meaning, Rabbi Meir was explaining the inner meaning of these garments. It was to illuminate, to allow the light of the soul to shine, to cover the body, not to negate the body, but to to cover it, to, uh, to take away the distraction of the body. 
so the light of the soul can shine through. And therefore it's called kotnot or garments of light to, al to allow that light to shine through, the deeper light to shine through. And, and so this dual purpose of clothing, on the one hand to cover nakedness, shame, embarrassment, lowliness, but on a higher level to cover over our physical self so the light of the soul should shine through, the deeper soul should shine through. These, these two functions of clothing apply to us now. And it would seem that when Mashiach comes, and certainly when the resurrection happens, it could be that the first function to cover up nakedness and embarrassment will be gone because we'll be on a high level. But the second level will come back, will, will remain. The, the level of wearing clothes to allow the light to shine, its brightness to shine, that will still remain when the resurrection happens. That clothing will only have one reason then, and that is to allow the light of the soul to shine through. In fact, fascinatingly, the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, the great Kabbalist, he taught that Adam and Eve, before they sinned, actually were wearing garments. We said before that they only wore garments after they were embarrassed of themselves, after they sinned. But the Arizal said, no, they wore garments before, but the garments they wore before they sinned were garments of light. They were surrounded by light. Their body shone with a light. And that was their garment. The, the physical body was holy. It was, it, it, and, the, and the light of the soul shone through it. So it was surrounded by light. That was the garment before the sin. But when they sinned, that light disappeared. And they were left naked. The nakedness before was not embarrassing because it was light. But after, it was just physical nakedness. And that had to be covered up. And when the resurrection happens, that light will come back. The light of the body will come back. And so will we wear garments? Yes, but garments of light, kotnot or. Not the same garments that we wear now. In fact, you could maybe explain that this is what the Midrash that we quoted earlier said, that the way we leave the world, that's the way we come back. If you're deaf, blind, or, lay, or, or mute, then you come back that way. And the way you're clothed when you leave the world is the way you'll be clothed when you come back. And then the Midrash says, and God says, let them come back and I will then heal them. So just like we'll be healed from deafness or blindness or any other physical ailment, so too we'll be healed from the clothing. We'll come back wearing clothing, but we'll be healed from the shame of our, na uh, our nakedness. We'll be healed from the lowliness of the, our physicality. And we'll wear garments of light, elevated garments of light. It's interesting that in, in the Hebrew language, the word for clothing is beged. Beged, begadim. Beged is, is, is clothing. So it's been pointed out that the word beged itself expresses these two levels of clothing. Because the word beged comes from bagad, which means to be treacherous. To, to, to lie, to, to fool, to trick. A boged is somebody who switches sides, a traitor. And so clothing, a traitorous, a treacherous, clo clothing can be a, a complete contradiction to our soul. If we wear clothing that emphasizes our bodily self, our physical self, if we wear clothing that that uh, exposes our physicality, that's a rebellion against ourself, our soul. And one of the reasons why we have to wear clothing is because we rebelled. Adam and Eve rebelled against their soul, and so we have to cover our nakedness. But on the other hand, the word beged is made up of three letters in Hebrew, bet, gimel, dalit. Bet Gimel Dalit are in alphabetical order, the second, third, and fourth letters of the Hebrew alphabet. All that's missing is the first letter, the Aleph. The letter Aleph is a completely silent letter. It's the first, it represents the number one, and Aleph is always associated with the divine. 
just like God is ineffable, indescribable, no, there's no pronunciation, and he is one, he's singular, and he's the beginning of everything, so to the letter Aleph, has no sound, no description, it's one and singular, and it's the beginning of everything. It's the divine self. That's the essence of soul, which is the divine. Beged, clothing, is what comes after, what covers over the Aleph. The Bed Gimel Dalit is what comes, comes next, creates layers over the Aleph. And that is not to cover the Aleph, it's to express the Aleph. The Beged, the clothing, is to cover over our physical self and allow the Aleph that comes before it to shine through, that silent, deeper light to shine through. Indeed, the word light in Hebrew is Aleph. Vavresh, it starts with the Aleph. So, will we wear clothes when Mashiach comes? Yes, certainly when Mashiach comes, we'll be wearing clothing. Uh, the clothing will eventually even grow on trees. Will we wear clothing when the resurrection happens? Yes, we certainly will. We'll be resurrected in the clothes that we were buried in or, or that we died in, according to some. But we'll certainly be wearing clothes. But what type of clothes will they be? They'll be clothes that are clothes of light. That the light of the soul will shine through the body. The physical body at the resurrection will be so holy that the light of the soul will be obvious and shine. And in the meantime, today, where we're in this world, the current world, Mashiach has not yet come, the resurrection has not yet happened. But in anticipation of that, the clothes we wear should also reflect that light that we anticipate in the future. The clothes should be clothes that add out in our dignity, that don't increase our physicality, but are modest, cover ourselves, cover our physical self, and allow the deeper light of the soul to shine through. Thanks and have a great night.